Welcome to The Indigenous Approach, a podcast where we examine the role of the nation's premier partnership force across the competition continuum, from cooperation to conflict and everything in between. In this episode, Major David Thompson, the commander of Alpha Company 96 Civil Affairs Brigade, and Mr. James Fleming, the USAID Bureau for Humanitarian Assistance Deputy Assistant Administrator, discuss humanitarian aid and interagency relationships. Welcome to the Indigenous Approach podcast. My name is Major David Thompson from the 95th Civil Affairs Brigade, and I'm your host for today. I'd like to introduce our guest, Mr. James Fleming. Mr. Fleming is currently the Acting Director of the Bureau of Humanitarian Assistance at the United States Agency for International Development. Mr. Fleming, welcome to the show. Please tell us a bit about yourself and how you got to where you are today. Thank you, Major Thompson. Um, I am the Acting uh, Deputy Assistant Administrator for the Bureau for Humanitarian Assistance at, at USAID. My normal job is I'm the office director for Asia, Latin America, and the Caribbean uh, at the Bureau for Humanitarian Assistance in the U.S. uh, Agency for International Development. Uh, We are the U.S. government um, lead agency for humanitarian assistance um, and disaster response uh, overseas. And I've been in this uh, field for over 20 years. Um, After college, I did a stint in the U.S. Peace Corps, uh, teaching physics and math uh, in a high school uh, in Cameroon, West Africa, which gave me a taste for the international work. Um, My first real job uh, after that experience was working for a U.N. organization called the International Organization for Migration, uh, dealing with a variety of issues. Um, And I was exposed to a little bit of development, a little bit of humanitarian assistance, a little bit of refugee resettlement, but I really gravitated toward the humanitarian assistance aspect of that job. So my next job after that was uh, called the Office of Foreign Disaster Assistance, uh, OFDA. Worked there for 20 years. And recently the Office of Foreign Disaster Assistance merged with the Office of Food for Peace at USAID to become the Bureau for Humanitarian Assistance. That's excellent. Uh, USAID is one of civil affairs' biggest partners in the interagency community. Uh, In addition to what you just said, can you tell us a bit more about USAID? Yeah, and I'll say that we consider civil affairs one of our biggest partners as well, especially in the humanitarian assistance arena. But USAID is an agency. It's really responsible for you know, developing the economic prosperity of countries uh, around the world. And it does so in a variety of different ways. It does so in humanitarian assistance. That's one aspect of the agency, and that's where I represent, but a lot of other areas as well. Examples are global health. Uh, We work with um, specific programs for women uh, and girls, Um, stabilization uh, efforts uh, after civil conflict. The agency does agriculture and food security programs, uh, democracy uh, and governance uh, building, uh, education, climate change, and economic growth uh, and trade. And you mentioned that you started off in OFTA, Office of Foreign Disaster Assistance, and that merged and became the Bureau Bureau of Humanitarian Assistance, Humanitarian Affairs. Uh, What can you tell us about it? Yeah, the Bureau for Humanitarian Assistance has a a very uh, clear mandate, one of the things that I like about it. Um, The mandate really has three components. One, save lives. Uh, Number two is alleviate human suffering. And then number three, reduce the impact of disasters uh, around the world. And where humanitarian assistance is Um, interesting to me is we really focus on the world's most vulnerable people. Um, And that's who we target. Those are, that's our population of who we're trying, um, you know, to help. And it's um, just a component of USAID, uh, but it is a little bit different from all the other uh, types of programs that that the agency operates. So David, I have a question uh, for you. Speaking of humanitarian assistance, um, like what do you think about uh, when you hear about humanitarian principles? Well, the principles of humanitarian action are one, humanity, necessity, impartiality, and independence. Uh, humanity means that human suffering must be addressed wherever it is found. Neutrality means that humanitarian actors cannot take sides in hostilities. Impartiality means that humanitarian action must be carried out on the basis of need alone. And then independence means that humanitarian action 
uh, must be autonomous from the political, military, and other objectives that the actor may hold. So it, to me, it brings up an interesting point. How does BHA, as a US government agency, apply these principles? Can you really be independent when you're a US employee? Yeah, David, I think it's a really good question. And before I answer that, I'm gonna say, you know, nice job on answering the humanitarian principles. Uh, that was well done. I also think that this is important for the military audience to understand is when they're interacting with the civilians working in humanitarian assistance, that these principles are important to all the people that are working in it, which may explain why we can talk past each other. I know we'll get into that a little bit later in, in, the, in the program. But in terms of, um, independence and neutrality. I think you're right, like being a representative of the US government, it's hard to say that you're completely neutral because the United States uh, as a government is not neutral, especially in these areas where we're working where there's uh, conflict. However, what we really try to do is we try to base our humanitarian aid on this principle of impartiality. And that is we are providing assistance to the world's most vulnerable people the person that is most uh, at risk from losing their life, as an example, regardless of what side of a border somebody is on, regardless of what side of the conflict, regardless of what their you know, religion happens to be, what their political persuasion happens to be, what their nationality is outside of an American, where we're the overseas, we provide assistance overseas, not to American citizens. So that would be the only uh, distinguishing characteristic. But these principles are really important. So we are trying to look exclusively at that vulnerability, regardless of everything else. And in the funding that we provide to organizations, those organizations have very similar principles. And so they also have an operational independence uh, from the uh, government in the country that they're working. They're also targeting the most vulnerable. And we monitor and evaluate how successful we are uh, in delivering assistance in that way. So, you know, it also raises a couple of points um, in looking at the differences between you know, what USAID does uh, in humanitarian assistance uh, and what Department of Defense uh, may do with humanitarian assistance. One, one difference I'd like to point out is that, you know, you think of the military as having a very strong command and control uh, system, and that is fundamental to um, a military operation. If you look at a humanitarian operation, you've got donors like the US government, but you also have implementing agencies like the NGOs, you also have coordination entities like the U United Nations, and all of those are voluntary, right? So we don't have command and control. Nobody has command and control over these. So having this common set of principles is really important so that we can operate uh, in the, the same environment. That's point number one. Point number two I had for DOD is, you know, a lot of times, uh, civil affairs, um, I noticed that you operate with a certain uh, appropriation uh, called uh, Overseas Humanitarian Disaster and Civic Aid, ODACA. But what I've noticed is that this ODACA, where you, it seems humanitarian, doesn't always do just purely humanitarian works. Is, is, that, is that your experience? Correct. So ODACA can be used for humanitarian-like, humanitarian-esque assistance in many cases. Uh, so at times it can be used to assist in a formally declared humanitarian crisis, uh, but oftentimes, say the majority of times, it's used for non-humanitarian type assistance. And as military members, we're not humanitarian actors. Uh, neutrality, independence, impartiality obviously uh, doesn't necessarily exist with us. Uh, but for USAID and the interagency community, what would differentiate something from humanitarian assistance or disaster response, HADR, uh, compared to normal assistance? Yeah, and I think this is important because my, my um, view of the term humanitarian assistance means different things to different people. There are certain um, parts of even the US government that think humanitarian assistance includes everything except for war fighting, right? That if we're building a school, uh, or saving a life with a, with a medical clinic, all of that is humanitarian. However, our definition is much more narrow. 
the, the definition of humanitarian assistance for us is that life-saving assistance. And again, that is underpinned by this idea that you are targeting the most vulnerable people. Devlama, as an example, maybe you're not targeting the most vulnerable people because if you're trying to uh, do, let's say, um, economic uh, growth, investing in the most vulnerable isn't gonna give you a return on investment. You need to maybe invest on people that are uh, stabilized to a certain degree to be able to build their business or enterprise or whatever it is. Whereas humanitarian assistance, that is not a factor. We are looking only at uh, the, the most vulnerable. And so that's one of the things that differentiates uh, development from uh, humanitarian assistance. But as we said, there are lots of agencies that you know, incorporate all of that under one umbrella called uh, humanitarian assistance. But it's an important point to think about if you're interacting between the military and USAID as an example, that there may be a slight difference in the definition of terms. Yeah, so for, for the, the military, when we are participating in a humanitarian assistance or disaster response situation, HADR, uh, Department of Defense Directive 5100.46 lays off the criteria for us to be able to participate. Uh, and during an HADR with DOD support, USAID would take the lead with DOD in a supporting role. Uh, but there's certain criteria that must be met before the US government as a whole can respond to an international disaster. Do you know what those criteria are? And what kind of type of tools in your response categories would BHA use to respond? Sure, it's a good question, David. And you know, it's another fundamental of you know, how we operate. So when we are providing a response to humanitarian crisis, there are essentially three criteria that must be met before we uh, respond. One, we have to have a request from the affected government. And this um, ties back to this idea of sovereignty, uh, like that the affected country is, government is responsible for, for that country. So that's number one. Number two is that the disaster must exceed the capacity of that country to respond. So as you can imagine, we are not responding to many disasters uh, in the developing world, like in Norway. So this, this is an important um, aspect as well. And then last, the response must be in the interest of the US government to respond. It seems a little bit reflexive because providing humanitarian assistance where it's needed seems like that would always be in the interest of the US government. But there are cases where that may not be the case. So for instance, if we are providing assistance that would be um, taken by a government and provided to armed fighters, that's not an appropriate uh, humanitarian intervention and that, that would not be in the interest of the US government to respond, um, even if we had met the, the other criteria. So when the United States is um, responding to a disaster, um, these are the criteria that we use and also um, what we're looking at when we are requesting assistance from the Department of Defense uh, to respond. So, most in answer to your second part of your question on how we respond, you know, we have the majority of our response is through funding. We provide funding to implementing organizations that are re responding to uh, the disaster. This could be funding the International Medical Corps to set up a clinic um, in you know, uh, an earthquake zone. It could be funding um, UNICEF to set up water sanitation and hygiene uh, programs uh, following a, a typhoon. That's largely um, what we do. However, there are other uh, tools in the toolbox. One, as you alluded to, is uh, interagency cooperation. Uh, we will also cooperate with uh, the Department of Defense, the Department of State, um, you know, other agencies as they have very specific skills, uh, U.S. Geological Survey, the U.S. Forest Service, um, all of the Department of Agriculture have certain skills that we can deploy, you know, as needed. You see, the idea is that we are responding to innocent, um, essentially civilians, regardless of what has caused the vulnerability. 
So this could be to a natural disaster like a earthquake or a hurricane, but it also could be for a human caused event like uh, civil, civil strife. So there are lots of cases where um, we have the tools to respond to those, but a lot of cases we don't, where we were looking for the unique capabilities of the Department of Defense uh, as an example. I like two points on that. So your first talk about, we talk about the, the criteria, the request um, and the sovereignty aspect. I like that. It's almost like it prevents a humanitarian invasion of sorts. It puts the onus on the country to where if they want us, they have to ask us to come. Uh, and then the interagency cooperation that aid as itself works with um, and then BHA, you work with other agencies, whether it's DOD, us, but also, I mean, you mentioned like forestry, probably CDCs in their agriculture state. Um, I like bringing that together. So can I ask you a question on that, David, just in terms of interagency cooperation, have you ever heard of something called a MITAM? Yes, a, a mission tasking matrix. So uh, I think a few examples of uh, the, the MITAM or the mission tasking matrix have included uh, Haiti. Uh, I think there was the earthquake in Indonesia in 2010, tsunami in Japan 2011, a few others. Uh, I don't know if it was an official MITAM uh, was submitted, uh, but I was able to participate in something um, from a ground level. Uh, there was a flood in Afghanistan in 2014. I was a team leader in Kandahar, but we diverted some goods that we had, uh, rain boots and jackets and sundry kits and such um, to Boglin province and uh, the assistance went out to those who were affected. Yeah, that's, it's perfect. And I think you, you had referenced uh, DOD Directive um, 5100, is it 0.06? 46, yeah. 46, yeah. And what that did is that signified that USAID was the lead federal agency for disaster response and DOD was the supporting um, you know, department. What's interesting in a lot of these cases is that DOD may outnumber USAID staff a thousand to one in some of these um, environments. So what we needed is we needed a clear way to provide um, guidance uh, to the military in a way that the military uh, could receive it. So this is, we jointly developed this MITAM, this mission tracking matrix that makes it very clear what has been requested, what has been done uh, and so forth. So a few of the ones that you know, I think have been highly successful, you mentioned uh, the Haiti earthquake. Um, DOD was absolutely critical in, in that humanitarian response and the United States received a lot of credit for having the largest response in Haiti and saving numerous lives, but it couldn't have been done without uh, the Department of Defense. Everything from um, operating the airport to restoring the port to providing safety and security for other humanitarian um, agencies. Um, I remember General Keene himself doing you know, humanitarian assessments uh, in displacement camps and the logistics operation that DOD could bring to bear was, was really tremendous. And I was on the ground to see that uh, myself, as well as having worked in our operation center in the early days of, of this uh, response. I also think of um, Indonesia and the great um, uh, earthquake that hit and tsunami that hit um, Indonesia in 2004, 2005. Um, you know, this was, a, the tsunami hit the coastline of Indonesia and knocked out all the roads. So to get humanitarian assistance up and down the coast, that was DOD. Rotary lift, um, as well as um, uh, vessels uh, getting humanitarian supplies and equipment and personnel up and down the coast. I even remember there was a aircraft carrier group, it was the Abraham Lincoln, was even um, providing water um, with the, the desal um, operations uh, on the aircraft carrier. And that was absolutely essential uh, to getting that on the shore. And there's so many different you know, examples I could go through uh, of where DOD and USAID has worked very well together. You talked about the funding for organizations and in your example, I think you were talking about Indonesia where the, the roads were just wiped out completely. Uh, during some of these humanitarian disasters, people, not necessarily organizations, but people within the organizations have a desire to contribute. They see people in crisis and they, they want to help out. Sometimes that's, they want to donate jackets, they want to send shoes, they want to send whatever. Um, 
is that the most effective? It's a, it's a really good question, David. And you know, I think from our point of view, what we want to do is we want to you know, embrace uh, people's genuine wanting to help. But what we also feel like is we have 60 years of experience uh, doing disaster response and we want, what we want to do is help people um, contribute in the right way. We have a saying in the disaster business that cash is best because often, you know, it, if you use, you know, just $10 and purchase something here in the United States, you know, somebody has to ship that to, you know, wherever the disaster is. But if an organization can use that same $10 and purchase something locally, you know, all that shipping is, um, that shipping charge is saved. Plus you're injecting cash into the local uh, economy and that's helping them recover. Um, so a lot of times we say cash is best and we recommend donating to, um, you know, an organization of your choice. There was even an interesting uh, example though, uh, we had a public private partnership uh, with Amazon during the Hurricane Dorian response uh, in the Philippines. One of the things that they did is they recognized that a lot of times people don't wanna just send cash. You know, they want something tangible to send. So what Amazon did is they were this bridge. Um, the person in the United States on their computer could look on Amazon uh, and say, I want to donate to Hurricane Dorian. Amazon had a list of organizations that were accepting donations. So what you could do is you could say, hey, look, I want to help um, Samaritan's Purse, as an example, which was one of the NGOs that was providing medical assistance uh, in Bahamas. I want to purchase some medical supplies. You could go on Amazon, click this organization, click a supply, and then Amazon would deliver it to the Bahamas for this organization. It was fairly new, but I think it was very successful because it bridged that gap where it was the, exactly what was needed as defined by the organizations working on the ground that allowed the person to feel like they donated something tangible as opposed to you know, just money. And it was, a, it was an interesting experiment that worked out very well. That's, that's interesting. The, the public-private partnership, it goes more from just an interagency to like a whole of America approach. That's right. That's right. And by the way, I, I neglected to mention if um, ever you find yourself in an HADR situation and you want to give friends, families ideas of how to uh, donate appropriately, we fund an organization called the Center for International Disaster Information or CIDI. Org. Um, and you can look that up, CIDI.org, um, and they will have you know, a list of organizations uh, that are operating, a list of uh, appropriate giving ideas, even ways for diaspora groups. So let's say there's a disaster in Guatemala, and there's a lot of Guatemala uh, diaspora in the United States that want to help. This gives, gives ideas on how to even monetize a clothing drive so that you can turn that into cash and then send that over C so you don't have to ship it. Thing, ideas like that. So there are a lot of good resources um, on, that, on that page. That's excellent. So let's transition, let's play a game real quick. Uh, US budget going to foreign assistance, not just humanitarian assistance. So what portion of the US budget goes to foreign assistance? Is it A, 20%, B, 10%, C, 5%, or is it D, less than a mere 1%? Well, you know, it'd be interesting to see, you know, what the, you know, people listening to this would guess, but uh, I have a little bit of inside information uh, on this. So I know that the answer, you know, is, is D. Uh, the entire foreign operations budget uh, or percentage of the budget is just 1%. Anyway, Maybe I'll back up and just tell a story about an uh, interesting study uh, that, that, um, that someone did uh, with US attitudes toward international assistance. So there was um, a survey that was done and it said like, what percentage of the US budget goes overseas, right? And it asked Americans that. And Americans said, you know, they estimated 25%. And then the next question was, well, what do you think it should be? If that's, if, that's, if that's what it is, what do you think it should be? And the American public 
said it should be about 10%. That seems about right. And then in reality, where it's less than 1%. And what we do in humanitarian assistance is one tenth of 1%, right? There's a big discrepancy on what people think uh, it is and what it should be and what it actually is. Sort of an interesting study. So in DOD, we have aircraft that are billions of dollars that cost tens of thousands of dollars an hour to operate, bombs that are millions of dollars. But when it comes to humanitarian assistance, you're saying people all of a sudden get very cost conscious. You seem like a very nice guy, but why do people not like you? What did you do to them? <laughs> it's a, it's a re, you know, maybe you need to know me a little bit better and that would become clear. But you know, I, I, think, I think largely it is this idea that there's, it's, it's out of sync with reality. Like people have this perception that a lot more assistance goes overseas than actually does. And you know, I think that there's this, there's this idea that there are tremendous needs in the United States and to see this amount of assistance going overseas instead is really hard to stomach. But I think if people realized, you know, what percentage of the U.S. budget really is sent overseas, I think that you know people would have a, a, a better sense of that. And maybe this is you know a, a good inflection point to talk a little bit about you know values and even how you know, the United USAID contributes to to national security. But first, just on the values, um, you know, I think one of the poignant quotes that um, I have heard about justifying, um, you know, humanitarian assistance overseas was said by uh, President Kennedy. And President Kennedy, who founded USAID, said, look, as the most wealthy nation in the history of the world, we have a moral obligation to help others. Right, so I think I think that's true. I, I think we think of that even in our own neighborhoods. You know, we try to help our neighbors uh, in a time of need. You know, and, and we think of that even within the United States. I was driving back from Michigan uh, last summer, and I saw a whole line of um, electric trucks from my uh, electric company in Maryland that were coming back from Indiana uh, in response to a big storm. And I felt very happy that you know we were helping another state. Um, when in their time of need. And I think that extends even to other nations, right? We want to help other nations uh, in their time of need. But I will say it's not all altruistic. I think that there are real values even to the United States on providing you know, humanitarian assistance. And um, I don't know if you wanna dive into the national security strategy, but I think there is, there is, there's a good rationale for how USAID even fits into the national security strategy. No, I think the, so the values discussion, I think definitely resonates or resonates with our formation. So we have army values uh, that talk about duty, selfless service and honor. A lot of the same principles, I think guiding USAID. Uh, we're also, as a military, taking more efforts to be more inclusive and diverse. Um, you did mention the national security strategy. Let's go. Let's go back to that. I'd like to hear your thoughts on USA contributing to national security. Yeah, and I think that it's not, you know, intuitive to most people how you know um, overseas assistance can contribute to the national security strategy because I think the national security strategy. You're really thinking about you know, protection of, of the country and, and the defense of the country, which is right, the, the main mandate of Department of Defense. Um, and, you know, the, the idea that we protect the United States from, you know, from powers and you know, foreign powers and adversaries. Um, um, but the national security strategy is also trying to protect us from other threats. Um, and those threats are, um, a whole variety of threats. And the one that I think you know, has been most poignant lately is disease, right? We have all been affected by the COVID pandemic. There's not, I can't imagine a person in the world that hasn't been somehow affected by the COVID pandemic. And you know, this, this is a global, a global issue. And um, there's, there's, a, there's a quote I like that goes, that goes like this, a weak, public health system anywhere 
is a public health risk everywhere. And what that means is that if we have a weak public health system in a country that allows a virus to take hold and spread, or uh, even in the, in, the, in the context of COVID to have a, a mutation take hold and spread because they, we haven't worked on uh, responding to that pandemic uh, in a less developed country, it's gonna affect the United States, right? And I think that there is that direct uh, connection to our own national safety and security to our work overseas. And as you know, in the military, I'll just go one step further, is that a lot of times, um, you know, inequity, I believe, creates instability. And if you have um, an area where there are people that really don't have much, what you see is an increase in instability. And then what you get is the need for military inter intervention. You know, think of Afghanistan and Iraq, both of which, you know, I have been to alongside my military colleagues. And, you know, there was, you know, we talked about this before, but I think um, DOD um, has always supported this mission with that understanding that even what USAID does can help, you know, in the, the, the DOD arena. And I've heard a, a Secretary of Defense um, answer a question at a, a congressional hearing saying, you know, what, what would be the best investment um, for DOD uh, in providing stability overseas? And the Secretary of Defense said, more funding for USAID, exactly for this uh, ability to provide uh, a stabilizing force overseas that would prevent the US military from having to intervene. I heard a quote uh, from Secretary Albright a couple years ago. I don't know if it was a quote original to her, but she was the one I heard it. Uh, An ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. I think that touches a lot on what you're just saying right there. Yeah, I think that's right. And, you know, I would say that, you know, just to follow up on that point a little bit, it, 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 the Bureau for Humanitarian Assistance, we're really known for doing a lot of disaster response. So uh, the image people have is an earthquake in Haiti or Nepal, where we're, you know, sending urban search and rescue teams from, we've got a couple uh, that we work with, um, one from Fairfax County, Virginia, and another from LA County, California. Um, and they have, you know, 80 highly trained staff um, and, you know, even canine units. Uh, and the, the canine units are what people think of as the dogs, you know, searching for people. Um, and that is, it's, it's, a, it's an enormously effective uh, capability. But what we also do is disaster risk reduction um, so that hopefully we can help prevent the worst uh, effects of a disaster. So for an example, in Nepal, one of the things we did in Nepal was uh, help the country with retrofitting uh, hospitals and schools uh, for earthquakes. And in the Great Nepal earthquake from a few years ago, these buildings that we helped uh, retrofit, not one came down. Um, and it's pretty impressive. So that you're exactly right. We, we've seen studies where every dollar invested in prevention has a $5 or $10 return uh, on, on that investment uh, in disasters that don't happen. So in a humanitarian effort, what are some of your objectives and how do they fit within national objectives? Yeah, I think that um, the, the main objective is providing humanitarian assistance because it's the right thing to do. It kind of goes back to that principles discussion that, that this is the American ethic is that we help people when they need it most. So, so I, think, I think that's the, the first um, and primary one. But I think there, even though this is not the goal of it, I think there are ancillary benefits to it um, and that it, it provides you know, sort of a linkage in this uh, ever shrinking world. And an example uh, I mentioned earlier was Indonesia. Uh, and Indonesia is the, the largest Muslim country outside of the Middle East. And before the, the tsunami uh, in 2004, 2005, there was something like an 80% anti-American sentiment in Indonesia. Following the, the quake and tsunami and the 
massive US response from USAID and the military, the anti-American sentiment was 20%. So 80% positive towards the United States. And the reason I think that there was that massive a switch is that we provided assistance based on needs uh, and needs alone. And it was not tied to any other objectives. It didn't have strings attached. There was no economic objective. There was no you know, military objective. There was no diplomatic objective. And those are all reasonable objectives of the United States government, but providing assistance based on need alone, that really resonates with people. And I think that this also helps with our, all of our other efforts, be it military, diplomatic, economic, and so forth. We've looked at a few historical examples of where we've worked together. Are there any places where BHA is working with the US military currently? Well, I will say that um, we work with the military all the time um, and in every, in every theater. Um, USAID has liaison officers at every combatant command. BHA also has liaison officers at every combatant command and other places uh, across the globe. So, you know, this, this work is, is constant. Um, but I would say, you know, the, you know, the obvious areas uh, right now are, um, we, we're still recovering from the, the um, devastating hurricanes in Central America um, uh, over, the, over the, the late summer and early fall where DOD uh, played a role there too. So that was, that was a contemporary example. But then there are lots of conflicts uh, all over where you know, we're operating in the same space. Um, think Afghanistan, uh, Iraq, uh, Syria, Yemen to a lesser extent uh, between uh, both DOD um, and USAID, but Yemen uh, is, is, is another example. And these are just a few that you know, um, I can think of off the top of my head. Do you, can you think of others that I've missed? Uh, so are you all, does BHA have a presence in Syria or is it OTI? Both, um, USAID and OTI uh, have a presence uh, in, in, in Syria. And we have huge humanitarian programs on both sides of the, the conflict line, uh, as you will. And are you doing those through the START and SAP or? That's exactly right. That that's, that's the coordination point uh, for, for our efforts. Um, that's exactly right. Okay. Great. So you have people all over the world. We have people all over the world. If a soldier from First Special Forces Command is deployed and thinks that he or she may need BHA or USAID assistance, how would she or he go about getting that assistance? Hey, it's a great question. And I hope that if, if anyone takes anything away from this podcast, that this is it, um, that, you know, humanitarian assistance is, you know, um, I don't know, in lots of ways, it's counterintuitive on um, the right things uh, to do in an HADR environment. So that's what we want to play. We want to play that role of, you know, helping everyone uh, contribute in the most appropriate way. And the best way to do that is, you know, have a contact with the, the professionals uh, that are trained to do this. So as I mentioned, um, there is a USAID um, uh, development advisor uh, at most of the combatant commands, and there is a humanitarian assistance advisor at all the combatant commands. So that's number one. Uh, they can always reach back uh, to the combatant commands. USAID has a, 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 a civil military um, affairs um, unit uh, in USAID headquarters, which can be uh, a point of contact with LNOs uh, from the military. BHA also has an entire division devoted to uh, civil military uh, relations that can be another point of contact. Then in um, most major HADR um, environments, we will send LNOs uh, out to the field. So if it's the Haiti earthquake, we will have, I don't know, the Haiti earthquake in uh, 2010, we probably had you know, a dozen people dedicated just to um, that uh, relationship between the military uh, and USAID. So those people can be, um, you know, tapped to uh, provide uh, those linkages. 
Another one I'll just throw out as a civil affairs person is reach out to your local civil affairs person and uh, they can help with the interagency coordination. Yeah, and I'd also put a plug in for one of the things that um, USAID does as well is we do uh, annual trainings uh, around the world. And one of the courses uh, specifically designed for the military is a joint humanitarian operations course called Jayhawk. And pre-COVID, we were doing 200 of these you know, around the globe for military audiences. I don't know what, it, what it's been like during COVID, but it's also a great, a great course because not only do you learn some great material, but you build you know, some relationships with your you know, civilian counterparts. Um, so I don't know, David, if you've taken that course, uh, but what I've heard from military audiences, it's, it's well appreciated and well liked. Yeah, I actually got to go to the course while on quarantine, returning from deployment. So during my COVID quarantine period, I tried to maximize it and uh, attended the Jayhawk course virtually. All right, and even virtually, was it was it useful uh, for you in your CA role? It was great. Uh, I would recommend it to anybody, civil affairs or any other what we call MOS kind of job within the military. I'd recommend anybody to take it. Terrific, terrific. Well, James, Mr. Fleming, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Uh, on behalf of First Special Forces Command, I want to thank you for coming on the Indigenous Approach podcast and for all the work that you and your colleagues do all across the world. Major Thompson, thank you for the invitation. It's really uh, great to be here. And, you know, I think it's, it's really important for me because we so much value the relationship with the U.S. military. Um, and we hope that these, you know, engagements just, you know, help that, uh, become easier for both sides uh, when we are uh, in the thick of it. So thank you. Appreciate it. Nice talking to you. Take care. This has been the Indigenous Approach. We hope you have enjoyed this episode. Follow us on social media, and if you have suggestions for topics or guests, send us a message. Thank you for listening.